Season one of The Witcher is out, and if you're anything like us, then you probably binge the entire show in like a day. In fact, it was a pretty strong move by Netflix to put it out right before Christmas because it's short enough that you can binge the entire thing between meals and forced conversation with family members that you spend all year avoiding. Geralt of Rivia is, of course, a witcher, or in layman's terms, a monster hunter. Not that type of monster hunter. The kind who hunts monsters for money and, you know, sometimes surprise custody of children. The Witcher series of books and video games are drenched in some pretty awesome monster battles, and really the series has become synonymous with these types of epic showdowns, and this video is going to cover every beast, ghoul, and sylvan in the first season of the show. Now keep in mind that we're going to explain these monsters, their abilities, and specific attributes about them from a combination of sources. The show, the video game, and the original books will all be referenced, so keep that in mind as we interwind them kind of casually. And needless to say, there are spoilers for all of Season 1 to follow, and I shouldn't have to say this, but it's YouTube, and if I don't, someone will down in the comment section. So before we start, remember to like the video, it really helps out our reach and exposure, and at the end, if you dig it, you know, subscribe or whatever. The first monster we see Geralt fight in Season 1 in the very first scene of the very first episode is a Kikimora. It is a swampy bog creature. A very brief entry from the series Bestiary says this about it. A more abominable beast indeed is hard to find. Not quite a cockroach or a spider, it makes ladies faint and gentlemen feel disgusted. The Kikimora warrior reeks of the swamp. Kikimora and Kikimora monsters are large insectoid beasts who are extremely toxic to humans, which makes studying them extremely difficult. Their main method of attack are their limbs, which they use like spears in battle, as well as a projectile venom that they can spew like a frat kid during Hell Week. Their venom causes blindness as well as crippling body pain, and their body is covered by a thick armor plating that makes ranged weapons like bows and arrows less effective on them. They are highly susceptible to silver swords, as is pretty much nearly every other monster in the Witcher universe. The next monster we see is a Sylvan, and they are a very rare humanoid creature and herbivore. Sylvans are humanoids, but they feature horns on their heads, hooved feet, and tails similar to goats. Typically speaking, Sylvans are playful tricksters, and they're not considered to be threatening to people. They typically live within the Broculum Forest and other areas around the world. However, if threatened, Sylvans are known to be deceptively fast, agile, and powerful. They even have a defensive mechanism that allows them to spray a foul stench like a skunk. That kind of makes even the most battle-hardened witchers gag. And this isn't an easy feat considering how a witcher's occupation often takes them into places with horrible stenches and odors. In the books, as well as in the show, Geralt is hired to hunt and kill the Devil of Posada, a sylvan named Torque, who is stealing in order to feed his family. Next up, we have the Striga. Striga are human females that have been transformed into monstrous beasts by a specific curse. The beast within the show was cursed before birth and born a Striga, killing her own mother during the process of birth. There's only one Striga shown in the books, video games, and show, Ada the White. The curse on this particular child was placed on her as punishment to her father, the King of Temeria, for his incestuous relationship with his sister. Striga are incredibly powerful, even able to easily overpower witchers who possess strength and speed far above a normal human. Striga also typically tend to hunt and feed only during full moons, and they typically also tend to hunt within a hunting ground located near or around a place of comfort for them, like a nest. Seeing as Striga are really just cursed humans, it's possible to cure the curse and release the human from the Striga form. In order to do this, you must prevent the Striga from entering their place of comfort, or normally a sarcophagus, before the daybreak of morning. If they can't make it back to their place of rest, the curse will be lifted. If they do make it back to their coffin, well, you don't have to worry about it because you're probably already dead. The next monster we see appears to be a pet of an assassin, tasked with killing a noblewoman and a baby. Now, I gotta be honest with you guys here. I don't know with 100% confidence what this thing actually is. If you do, feel free to let me know down in the comment section, but trust that I did a good bit of research. It's possible that this is a modified Endriga warrior, notably without the tail, and it could be a modified Endriga of some kind or just some similar summoned insectoid, but regardless, this beast is very fast, uses its limbs as spears, and it's some type of mysterious species that seems to be vulnerable to decapitation much like everything else. 
We next meet the cursed man, Dooney. And we kind of didn't really mean to include this guy in the list. He's really more of an honorable mention. But Dooney is a prince within the world of the Witcher who carries a mutation curse. There's no specific monstrous form associated with him other than the fact that he kind of looks like a werewolf slash hedgehog. He really isn't a monster, and after midnight he transforms back into a man every day, but if I didn't include him, I feel like a lot of people would have questions about if he was a monster or not. Dopplers are up next, and they are also extremely rare. Dopplers are considered to be mimics or shapeshifters, and sometimes referred to as vexlings or changelings. Their natural form is pretty hideous. They're small humanoids with elongated limbs and tongues and noses. They look a bit like malformed elves. A Doppler is able to precisely mimic a person's features nearly identically, assuming a person is close enough to them in size and shape. Most Dopplers don't have an issue changing from a fully grown adult to a stout dwarf, though. The most famous Doppler within the Witcher series is Doo-Doo. Geralt interacted with Doo-Doo many times before he learned of his existence, having met him throughout his journeys disguised as other people he knew. Doo-Doo's able to take Geralt's form, and when you do fight Doo-Doo as yourself, it gives Geralt a pretty good idea of what others might have felt when fighting him. The Doppler can also instinctively copy a person's voice, body language, mannerisms, and to a certain extent, personality and skill set. However, each Doppler is unique in the way that it copies its chosen target. For instance, Dudu in the novel Sword of Destiny was able to copy Geralt exactly except for Geralt's nature. As Geralt put it, you only know how to copy the good in us because you don't understand the bad in us. So a good-natured Doppler would be unable to comprehend the darkness of an evil man's heart and wouldn't be able to convey their personality as effectively, and a bad-natured Doppler would be, you know, the opposite. The distrust of Dopplers has also led the species to being nearly hunted to extinction. This has also resulted in the remaining Dopplers being used primarily as assassins or thieves. Jinn are fascinating creatures from the standpoint of folklore. In terms of its ability set, it's easier to think of a jinn for what it really is, a genie. Genies are separated into four groups depending upon which of the four elemental planes they derive from, either air, water, fire, or earth. A jinn is a powerful air spirit, a condensation of the power of that element endowed with a consciousness and character, the latter usually nasty. According to legend, jinn can grant even the most ridiculous of wishes, but they do so begrudgingly. Jinn are extremely rare and extremely powerful beings. Throughout history, mages have been able to tame some of these creatures and use them to cast magical spells without having to call on traditional sources of magic. Jinn can use spells instantaneously that even the most gifted mages would never attempt to cast themselves. For example, the enchanter Stamelford had captured an earth genie and once used its power to move a mountain because it obstructed his view, and there are records of deeds accomplished by other magicians on a similar scale. For example, water genies have caused enormous waves and catastrophic rains, and fire genies have caused wildfires and explosions. So yeah, jinns are uh, pretty strong. They're very, very strong. Next, we have a Harika, and this creature is found by Geralt and others traveling on their way to hunt the dragon. However, not much is really known about this species. Its appearance differs greatly from the official material found on the author's website. The beast looks a bit like a humanoid marsupial with larger claws and teeth. Geralt does mention that they're extremely rare and hunted to near extinction, and like other animals and monsters in the show, they appear to be quite vulnerable to having their heads chopped off. The next monster we have to discuss is a fairly common monster throughout various fictional worlds, the dragon. And there are many types of dragons within the Witcher universe, and all of them are extremely rare. These beasts once ruled the continent absolutely, but as the numbers of men rose, these animals were hunted to pretty close to extinction, primarily due to the belief that dragons hoard treasure. Additionally, as dragons are sentient and intelligent creatures, it's against the Witcher's code to kill a dragon. All dragons feature similar elements, armor-plated hide that stained a particular color, gigantic wings capable of flight, razor-sharp claws and teeth. I mean, who doesn't know what a dragon looks like? But, but Dick, actually these are dragons, they're wyvern. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. My friends and I get into this discussion every single time we talk about Skyrim, but this show calls them dragons, so here we are. Green dragons are the most common dragons that exist. They are the smallest, usually about the size of a horse, and they also happen to breathe hot chlorine gas. Red dragons are significantly rare, and they grow to be about 15 meters and breathe molten fire. Black dragons are the rarest confirmed dragon that exists within the show, and they have been documented, but their size numbers aren't exact. Black dragons are also capable of breathing a horrible acid that can easily kill human beings and animals. 
Next, we also have white dragons, which exist within the books. They're not mentioned in the show, but you can think of them as your standard snow dragon. They are smaller than black dragons, coming in around 10 meters, but they feature the ability to breathe frost. And there are variations of dragons that are considered to be mythical, and we know one of these types of dragons that's even rarer than a black or white dragon. Gold dragons. Only two gold dragons have ever been seen in the world. These dragons appear to be between 15 and 25 meters, they breathe flames, and in an extremely rare ability set, they can also turn into any creature they choose, including humans. Golden dragons also have the unique ability of telepathic communication while in their dragon form. And the most famous of these dragons is Villain Trentmirth, and I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly, but Geralt meets him in the form of Borch Three Jackdaws. Dragons are also immune to all poisons and blade coatings. They're nearly impervious to bombs and traps, and they're highly resistant to pretty much anything that isn't a sword or axe, or an extremely well-placed arrow. And the final monster we have to discuss was the monsters that attacked Geralt at the end of the seventh episode. And these monsters were not specifically named, but in all likelihood, these were ghouls. Ghouls appear and attack from underground. They typically don't hunt the living, they prefer to feed upon the dead. They often appear in large numbers after battles or in places where dead bodies lay, like cemeteries. Ghouls only eat raw, aged, festering meat. However, over time, ghouls have learned to attack humans and kill them so that they can leave their bodies to age, and in return, and eat them later. They also typically tend to emerge underground only during full moons. In the show, the bite or claw mark that's made on Geralt seems to cause some type of poisoned effect in Geralt, but ghouls are not poisonous within the books or games, so that must have been something they added in for the show. So there you have it, every monster in the first season of The Witcher, and I'm excited for the second season whenever it does show up, and hopefully the monster hunts feel a bit more organic and meaningful in the second season. Personally, I would like to see a little bit more witching, maybe an arch griffin, an elemental, a golem, some vampires, a wraith, you know, spice it up. I hope you learned a lot, and if you did, you know, YouTube things, like, subscribe, yada yada yada. Thanks again for watching this video, this has been Nick with Key Issues, and you know the motto, Monsters over everything.